everyone, I'm Megan Sullivan and welcome to a special episode of History and Games, a video and audio podcast where I play historical fiction games and talk about the real history behind the game. Uh, if you'd like to check out History and Games, uh, be sure to hit up my Patreon at Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N, R. Sullivan, or you can go to my YouTube channel, Meg Sullivan, or you can listen for free on all audio platforms, including iTunes and Stitcher, et cetera, et cetera, and look for History and Apostrophe Games. Today, I have a special guest joining me, Dr. Jackson Crawford of the University of Colorado, who is the foremost authority on Norse language, myths, sagas, and the author of very accessible translations of old Norse works, such as the Poetic Edda and the Saga of the Volsungs. And I apologize for my terrible Norse pronunciation of those titles, but luckily, I have an expert with me who can help me with that. Dr. Crawford, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Hey, thank you very much for having me. I'm doing great. How are you? I am excellent. So I wanted to start this interview by giving you a chance to tell the audience what it is that you do and how your work is tied into Norse mythology and language and history, et cetera, because you have a really impressive resume. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm uh, an Old Norse specialist, so my PhD is in, uh, in fact, Scandinavian languages with a specialization in Old Norse and the text written in it. Uh, so I've been teaching for 13 years at different universities in the U.S., um, mostly during that time at UCLA, then at Berkeley, then at the University of Colorado. And uh, now I am uh, actually primarily a public educator, kind of trying to adapt to this new world and reaching out to people on uh, YouTube and through a series of translations of the original primary uh, materials. And I'm also making a uh, great courses class about Norse mythology. So I'm trying to kind of reach people where they're looking for this information. That, uh, is, uh, that is awesome. Yeah, I love your YouTube channel. And I know you've probably gotten this question before, so I apologize if it's a bit repetitious, but I have to ask, what was the catalyst for you becoming interested in Norse and Viking mythology and culture and language? Do you have, does your family have ties to Scandinavia or you just always been interested in Norse culture? Yeah, that's often part of the, the question is people look at me and they say, you don't look like, <laughs> you know, <don't look laughs> Right. Or, you know, your name doesn't end in son or something like that. So what's the connection? And, and it isn't it is not a family connection. Um, I was a dinosaur kid and uh, just loved dinosaurs. Me too, me too. So that's another part of that Oregon Trail generation we're all dinosaur nuts. But it is. It's a thing. But I love dinosaurs. And um, one of my best friends actually uh, runs a dinosaur museum now. So he he stuck with the dream. Oh, but, that's awesome. I'll, I'll give you more info about that. But he. Uh, so, so he and I still nerd out about this stuff. But uh, I was really interested in how dinosaurs had changed over time. And, and when I was a kid, the whole notion of birds being dinosaurs was kind of new. And uh, I was pretty excited about all this stuff. But um, in middle school, I got a chance to study Latin. I guess it was a good middle school. And uh, I did so because all the dinosaur names were in Latin. So I thought, well, this is going to be you know, helpful for me somehow. But from studying Latin and then comparing it to the Spanish that I heard around me, I realized that language evolved too. And so I got interested in, in like, well, if Spanish is a later form of Latin, then what's the earlier form of English? And I went looking for Old English, which I ended up studying on my own, and then Old Norse, which is really close to Old English, but kind of goes off in its own direction. I like to call it the forgotten sister. Um, and so... Uh, I just studied ancient languages throughout college and grad school, and at the PhD level, I specialized in Old Norse because I was fascinated by it. It's sort of like, like it's like English in an alternate universe. <laughs> well, it is. If you look at it, all the basic pieces are there, right? I mean, Vikings and 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 Englishmen before 1000 could understand one another, um, but then it's changed in its own weird little ways. And then the literature is great. Right? You get all these stories about the gods and the and the Viking heroes. I mean, it's much more exciting than most ancient and medieval literature. So, um, right. you know, it was enough to propel me along. And since I was mostly um, getting fellowships to pay for <laughs> for grad school, I just kind of kept saying, well, why not? And <laughs> PhD and teaching the stuff. Wow, that's really awesome. So am I correct in assuming like the, the closest modern equivalent of Old Norse language is something like maybe Icelandic or no? No, that's about right. So all the Scandinavian languages today are descended from Old Norse or something very close to Old Norse. So mostly when we talk about Old Norse in like a classroom setting or if I'm quoting some Old Norse text to you, it's it's 
technically, really specifically, Old Icelandic. That's where most Norse literature was written down. So Old Norwegian, Old Swedish, Old Danish is a little bit different from Old Icelandic, but very similar. Um, so the Icelandic language today has changed relatively little, although still some. And then if you look at something like Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, it's changed considerably more, but it's still recognizably descended of the same thing. Right. Are you able to understand because of your studies, modern Scandinavian languages at all? Or is it just kind of like, you know, it's as hard to understand modern English as it is like Beowulf from a thousand years ago because it's old. Well, yeah, it all helps. Uh, but I was studying both at the same time. I speak uh, modern Scandinavian languages, too. So I can't like give you a sense as an old Norse speaker, like how it sounds to me, because I just learned all that stuff at the same time. <laughs> oh. Wow, that's impressive. So you obviously have an impressive depth of knowledge when it comes to things like Old Norse language and culture. And I know that you, and I think a lot of the audience knows that you've worked on a number of uh, different projects that have to do with Norse language and culture, uh, different media projects, uh, including, you know, movies, games, et cetera, et cetera. And I was wondering if you could sort of give us a couple of examples of like what you've worked on and what the experience was like. Sure. Um the the first big one was Frozen. Yeah, uh, Frozen. <laughs> it was a lot. Um, so I was teaching at UCLA at the time. And actually, that didn't start with Frozen. I was attached to a different Disney project first. Oh, and then wow. that project got canned. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, but they reached out to me because I was just the closest person who did this stuff, right? It was like 2011. And I'm the guy at UCLA who teaches Old Norse, and they're in LA, so just I'm just the close guy. So they said, hey, could you help us with this movie? And that first movie ended up not getting made, but they'd already vetted me, so I was already in the Rolodex when they decided they wanted some actual Old Norse language stuff in Frozen. Um, so I ended up writing the runes that you see in Frozen 1. I didn't, I didn't do anything for Frozen 2, or I did, but they didn't use any of it. But if you look at Frozen 1, any of the runes you see, I wrote that, like the book at the beginning. Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah, then there's also the coronation scene where he puts the crown on uh, Elsa's head and he says some right. stuff. It goes by so fast, a lot of people don't even hear it. Um, but it's kind of fun because the actor even kind of, like, his voice even kind of changes when he's imitating me. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's the one most noticeable thing is that when he speaks Old Norse, he sounds more like me. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're technically in the movie. That's right. I, that my influence knows no bounds. Um, <laughs> And then it was funny because they wanted a, um, uh, they asked me what a Norse wedding was like. And what's kind of funny is that in the sagas, they don't really describe this stuff because all this stuff is written for the same culture. Right. Right. Just like today, if you ask me, like, like, like if I say, oh, I was at a wedding yesterday, you know, you're not going to ask me, oh, did the bride wear white? Because they all, <laughs> right. It's like, it's just something taken for granted. So they don't describe weddings. So I said, well, we don't really know. Um, but they said, well, what's the closest thing you can tell us about? I'm like, I know about this blood brother ceremony. <laughs> it's it's kind of cool because you dig a pit, you make an arch of the dirt you've dug out over it. And then the two men who want to be legally brothers, right? One is obligated to avenge the other. They cut their palms, clasp them under the earth, and then walk out of the arch together. They're symbolically reborn from the womb of the earth together. So I said, maybe something like that. But anyway, they, of course, didn't use the blood part, but when the trolls uh, have Anna and Kristoff, they dig a pit and make a arch over them, and they kind of act like they're going to marry him. Oh, see, that's great. I didn't even know that. That's a really cool story, because yes. it, Frozen is not only a popular movie, but it's a super fun movie, so knowing it has real history in it makes it even more valuable. So speaking of history, my show History and Games is all about real history and video games, and it suddenly seems like Viking culture and Norse mythology are just everywhere in video games. So of course, you've got like the new God of War, you've got upcoming Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you have other series like, you know, Hellblade and the Banner Saga. What is it, do you think, that makes Norse culture so popular in video games, just any medium, really? Yeah, I, my personal theory, and I could be wrong, is that a lot of this starts about 20 years ago with the new Lord of the Rings movies. Ah, good call. Yeah, so I think a lot of people... Um, saw those movies and fell in love with kind of the feeling that they evoke, which 
you know, J.R.R. Tolkien was deeply influenced by Norse mythology. You can find a lot of real specific things he took from it, like how all the dwarf names in The Hobbit come from the old Norse poem Voluspal. Ah, oh, good. That's, so, yeah, I never thought like, of that. Yeah, there's a list of dwarf names, and he took all the names of his dwarves from that list of dwarf names. And Gandalf is also on that list, which I don't know the story behind that. But, <laughs> but So there's specific things, but there's also a mood that he kind of evokes that's very similar to the Norse myths. Um, and I think part of it is almost accidental in Norse mythology. It's because we have so many things that are missing, right? Every poem you read that survives from before the Christianization of Scandinavia you know, you read some some strange thing like, and as we all know, Loki did this. It's like, no, we don't all know. What are you talking about? We The story didn't come to us, right? It's so random, the things that do survive. So you always kind of feel like you're out at sea and there's heavy fog and only occasionally are you actually managing to find an island. So you have this feeling of mystery all over the place. And I think he evokes that deliberately in a way that may almost be accidental with the Norse myths. But there's also just kind of a, an aesthetic that I think he evoked, right? You know, this sort of, this, this, it's, it's dark in a particular way that's hard to describe. And I think Tolkien evokes that. And so anyway, I think that gave people a taste for more and they went looking for, for more of that kind of atmosphere. And you start seeing it explode uh, every decade of the 21st century, a little bit more, right? I mean, there was the Vikings TV show, there was the Thor movies too. Um, so I do think that's a big part of it. Um, and it could be cyclical. I don't know. Maybe it'll fall off at some point, but it sure hasn't yet. No. And in fact, you mentioned Thor. And of course, I have to show my audience my nerdy collection of like, here's my female Thor that I got uh, at a comic book convention. And of course, being a Marvel fan, I've got Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston in little toy form. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because people kind of associate uh, Norse mythology and, and and the sagas and everything with the marvel movies but uh you know with the rise of all these different you know tv shows and movies i feel like there's room to make mistakes what would you say is like the mi most misunderstood thing about norse culture something that just drives you nuts well i'm pretty zen <laughs> it doesn't drive me nuts that much because i i tend to say and maybe this is because I talked to too many people in Hollywood or whatever, but I tend to say, look, you are the current saga makers. Every generation that retells a story changes things. Like it, so it doesn't drive me nuts that just, you know, some little thing gets changed. I think that the main problems come from the fact that today people, like if you see it on a screen, that becomes more authoritative than anything you see. It's not on a screen. Right. Right. So like the Marvels, for example, Thor and Loki are brothers. Well, they're actually not in the original Norse mythic texts. Right. So if I take Norse mythology, right. one of the things I have to remember is people have seen the Thor movies. And so the what's been burned into their brains is that these are brothers when in fact that's not their relationship. Um, so I have to kind of do a little bit of work like that and, and say, well, you know, OK, that's its own world. It's its own thing. You know, and I don't I don't care. That's the 21st century version of the story but we've got to deal with the original thing here as far as like actually um really profound misunderstandings that i think uh emerge today one is that people really want the norse myths to be canonical in a way that they're not right each poem that survives from the viking age has its own kind of it's it's i like to say that it's like different uh, different series about the same comic book characters Right. So like in this one, Jean Grey and Cyclops never got married. <laughs> right. <laughs> in this one, Jean Grey and Wolverine got married. And in this one, Jean Grey and Cyclops got married and later divorced. And then she married Wolverine. And then she divorced him and then married Cyclops or whatever. Right. So there's all these different sort of like it's the same characters. They're recognizably the same, but there's sort of different timelines with them. And they may contradict one another because one may be from Norway. One may be from Denmark. One may be from 900. One may be from 1000. And things change. And so people come expecting like this single storyline that just just isn't there. You just have to kind of accept that the characters are the same, but they're going to be kind of recombined in different ways. Or, or another way I put it with people is, who's the correct James Bond? I mean, you may have an opinion about that. Right. But whether he's played by Sean Connery or by Daniel Craig or by Pierce Brosnan, he's still James Bond. Right. 
and he's recognizably the same character. And that's kind of how the, the gods are in these poems, too. I think that's a great way to think about that because it, it is, it, it's just kind of like the Marvel universe where we don't have a, a long canonical thing. We don't know a lot about it. You're saying that there are kind of gaps in the story because there were, you know, these sagas were for an audience already familiar with this, you know, pantheon of gods. And we don't know, you know, everything about them or their function. In fact, one of my questions was, you know, Loki being one of the more popular gods, he appears in every game and every movie and every TV show as a foil to the protagonist and whatnot. But I have to ask, do you have any idea what his actual function was in everyday Norse life? Do we have any guesses? Because it, it seems like a huge mystery. He is a huge mystery. He and he's different every time you see him. Like he really is. If 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 there is a pretty consistent set of characters with pretty consistent characterizations, he's the Joker in all of it. Is he gonna show up as a good guy? Is he gonna show up as a bad guy? Right? Because sometimes he's just sometimes stories about him and Thor are just like buddy cop stories. Yeah. Right? They're different, right? Thor is kind of the straight guy, uh, you know, and and kind of humorless, uh, and jokes are made at his expense. And Loki's kind of like the freewheeling guy who's going to do anything and is going to be making the jokes. But they're working together for something, right? Like Loki helps Thor get his hammer back when his hammer gets stolen. Um, Loki just accompanies Thor on random trips sometimes, and they seem to be okay. And then at other times, you see like Loki as the the father of all the monsters that will kill the gods at the end. And Loki will side with the monsters against the gods at, at Ragnarok too. And, you know, Loki has done something, actually sources disagree about what it is, but he's done something that's worth chaining him up with the guts of his son to a rock and having poison dripped on his face by a snake for the rest of eternity till Ragnarok. Jeez, that does not make it into the Marvel movies. <laughs> they don't want to ruin Tom Hiddleston's pretty face. <laughs> no, well, actually, that's also something. Another thing that doesn't make it into the movies is his lips were sewn shut. So although he's a shape changer in his na native natural form, he's supposed to have ripped up lips. Oh, he's, man. He's opened his mouth, and so he, but he's still got a scar from where it was. It was right, sunk. and that was when the dwarves, oh. they, they, they sewed his mouth shut because he's getting real, real mouthy, right? But yeah, he... Lied, I, he he went back on a bed. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah. Can't do, can't do he, uh, that. No, he bit his head and uh, and and uh, he he crawfished on the bed, as we say out here. <laughs> I love that. So, you know, going back to video games for a second, because, you know, we're talking about the popularity of Viking Norse lore. And in the new Assassin's Creed Valhalla, players will be able to participate in Viking rap battles called Flightings. And I've seen your YouTube video about the local Senna where you describe, you know, describe it as Loki's locker talk and he gets real mouthy and he kind of has a rap battle with the Norse gods. And it, it's it's super crazy. But uh, I think the audience and I kind of want to know, is that a real thing that, you know, Norsemen did? Or is that just kind of one of those misunderstandings and exaggerations that the sagas sort of cling on to? It's a real thing. Um, I've always been a little bit mystified by the use of the term flighting, because that's actually a Scottish term. I'm like, it just seems weird that we use this word that's unfamiliar to describe something that's unfamiliar. Why not just call it insult battles or something? But right. anyway. It's the term that seems to have stuck in English. Um, you see it more with stories about the human heroes than about the gods. So um, very often in the sagas, the, you know, the hero of the saga is always going to be like the the perfect or almost perfect man, right? He's, he's always going to be described as very handsome. He's going to be the best fighter. You know, nobody can beat him at anything. You know, he, he can always jump higher than everybody else for some reason. It's always... <laughs> it's, like, like, it's, it's like a necessary trait. It's, it seems necessary. Um, and then they're also always, are almost always great poets. It's unusual when they're not good poets. And so um, one of the big, you know, and it's something you can see it as being almost like a superpower. One of the big traits of theirs is they can usually just sort of compose like that. They can make some awesome, completely, you know, perfectly composed poem just on the spur of the moment. And so their enemies will often also be really good poets. And so they'll get into these kind of matches where they're fighting each, you know, each one is laying down a verse and then the other one comes back at him. And sometimes they kind of coordinate, right? So they're going to, like, each one is going to use the same word, you know, one time in each line of his poem or something like that. Sometimes the insults are incredibly vicious. Like stuff I wouldn't repeat on a family-friendly show like this. Yeah, I mean, not not so much. Loki says some pretty terrible things in the Locust Center where it's like, wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so Loki is really participating in a very, a very real uh, cultural thing, which is insulting people in poetry. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, and it's not that different from, yeah, from a lot of rap. Um, you know, both sides are expected to kind of participate in it. Um, the response will be poetic as well. But one thing that's kind of funny is if you read Locusena, so for, for context for people who may not know what this is, Locusena is a poem that survives from probably is originally orally composed about the 900s, so before Scandinavia is Christianized, where Loki, um, I'll, I'll shorten the beginning of it, make a long story short, he busts into a feast of the gods and starts insulting everybody. But if you notice, every time he insults one of them, they never say, no, that's not true. Right? That's, they yeah. always they always just counter with something about him. So it's sort of implied that all the insults are probably true. And uh, it's worth pointing out that the word Senna, lok, Loka is the possessive form of Loki, so it's like Lokis. Senna means truth telling. So the Senna, which is the exchange of poetic insults, is in terms of what its etymology is, it's, it's the truth telling. It's you telling uncomfortable truths about each other in poetic form. Man, I cannot wait to do that in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. That's that's going to be super, super fun. And, you know, it's funny because Ubisoft also, at the same time, wants to introduce a more balanced perspective about, you know, the Vikings and, and, and Norsemen. So that'll be really interesting because, obviously, that is that is a real thing that, uh, that Vikings did. Do we know if uh, the Vikings and Norsemen actually had tattoos and mullets by the way there seems to be a little bit of controversy we know there's some descriptions but can you kind of talk a little bit about that real fast yeah i don't know how the mullet specifically kind of got out there we we don't know that much about the hairstyles right um when men are described in the sagas we'll get something generic um you know uh sometimes they'll set up a character as kind of like this like I, I don't know what, what else to call it, but like they try to describe him as sort of a quote hunk or something. And often they'll say, well, like he had hair down to his shoulders then. Like, okay, but we don't know what that style is, right? Is it kind of like, is it knotted or tied or like, a, is there a tail or is it just kind of hanging? Like it, they don't really describe it. Sometimes you can look at art from that period. Of course, from the actual Viking age, you're often just looking at carvings. Right. And you often see men with, with hair that's kind of swept back, but it doesn't look long, long. Um, they do always tend to have facial hair, and the sagas reinforce that too. Men without facial hair are made fun of. So that's certainly realistic. But tattoos, there's really no reason to think that they had tattoos. Um, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I'll say it's, it was prob it's unlikely. And if it was practiced, I don't think it was common. We have one source that attests that Vikings have tattoos. And that was an Arabic writer who met some, um, some Rus, right, a Swedish tribe that... Uh, explored in Eastern Europe and eventually gave their name to modern Russia uh, in 922 or 23. And he says that they were all tattooed. Okay. But nowhere else do we see a description of that from outsiders. And on the inside, there's no Old Norse word for tattoo. <gasps> see, I didn't know that last part. I, I knew the description. There was, there was one description, but I didn't know there wasn't even a word for tattoo so something something to think about although it's just it's kind of cool and fun to to see you know these characters running around with, with tattoos and everything and looking super super fierce um now there's like a treasure trove i i know that there they hint in ac valhalla you might see or run into gods we know that you run into gods in uh in assassin's creed and in fact it's interesting because in the new god of war game you know the main character kratos he is finished destroying the olympians and now he's moved on to a confrontation with the pantheon of norse gods and old uh ancient greek and roman writers briefly touch upon upon ancient germanic tribes and kind of liken their gods to their own is there any actual historical possible connection between the Norse pantheon of gods and Greek gods? There seems to be a tiny bit of crossover, but I'm, I'm not sure. Well, there's two sides to this. One is that the Greeks and Romans, when they write about other people's gods, have a hard time seeing them as distinct from their own, right? So when Tacitus writes about the Germanic gods in about uh, AD 90, he can only call them Mercury and Mars. And so we don't always know which exact Germanic god he's actually talking about. Um, there is ultimately a connection uh, if you go back 5,000 years, right? So if you go back 1,000 years, English and Norse are mutually intelligible. But if you go back 5,000 years, those are mutually intelligible with Greek, and Latin, and Sanskrit, and India, right? 
the more we roll back the clock, we get back to um, Proto-Indo-European, the ancestor language of most languages of India and Europe. And what's striking is that in parts of the Indo-European area, you find the same god names used in multiple different places. But the Norse gods' names are mostly not related to the names of gods anywhere else. So there's something going on with that. The one god's name that's uncontroversially related to a Greek god's name is the, na is the god Tyr. Now, Tyr has his hand bitten off by the wolf Fenrir when he puts it in his mouth as a pledge um, that Fenrir won't be in prison forever, but he is, so Fenrir bites it <laughs> off. And that's the only thing he really notably does. So he's a fairly minor god in our, in our written sources for Norse myth. He might have once been more important, but his name, if you run through all the sound change rules, is the exact same as Zeus or Jupiter. Wow, that yeah. is super interesting. So we've got, we, we do, if you just go back far enough, you have you have Zeus. That is a really cool, fun fact. So, oh, so I also wanted to ask, you know, there are so many gods, you know, in the Norse pantheon. We kind of know the, the usual suspects, Odin and Thor and Loki, but in your opinion, is there any Norse hero or god you'd like to see portrayed more in media? Somebody who's overlooked that whose story is actually really interesting. I think, well, I think Odin is actually not done well most of the time. He's too often portrayed as kind of like a kindly grandfather. One of the few places where you'll see Odin actually portrayed as the shifty guy he is is in American Gods. Um, that's actually a pretty good portrayal of his. So I would say seeing Odin done well is something that I don't see often enough. But then um, one story that I'm always amazed has just never really penetrated popular culture is the saga of Hervor and Heidrek. And that'll actually be in my next book. Uh, of course, everything is slowed down right now, so who knows when that'll be. But, <laughs> but it's done at least. It's just not yes, probably. hopefully hopefully soon. Hopefully soon, whatever soon means anymore. Um, but so it's actually the story of a woman who finds out that her father wasn't who she thought he was. She was always told that he was just a poor man, just a nobody, but she finds out he was actually one of the greatest warriors ever and that he was buried with a magical cursed sword. So she puts on armor uh, and disguises herself uh, under a man's name and she goes and she finds her dad's burial mound, breaks into his burial mound and confronts his zombie, takes oh the gosh. curse. It's, I mean, it's just this, just the guitars are just screaming this whole time, right? I mean, it's just this, it's so rock and roll. And uh, she takes this cursed sword from her dad's zombie after they exchange poems. You know, it's 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 it's, it's a rock opera the whole way. <laughs> and, you know, she goes on to have a son who inherits the sword and he does all this. Cra it's a crazy adventure story. And I don't know how that hasn't penetrated into to popular awareness more because it's just this rocking story. I see. I would play the heck out of that video game. That sounds like that would be an just completely epic. I mean, all the adventures you could have. You know, strong female protagonist with a kick butt sword, and oh man, I, I yeah, I'm gonna have to suggest that to some video game friends of mine, <laughs> or I could try. Give, give them my number. That's it's, <laughs> and every time, so the sword is cursed. Every time it's drawn, it has to kill someone. What? That's crazy. So sometimes it gets accidentally drawn in the story and there's always drama. Like I got to kill somebody. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Yes. This, this, this has to be, this has to be a game. I'm sure there are games that kind of touch upon it, but I haven't actually known much about this story. So I feel like that is just the perfect opportunity for someone to make this game. And yes, I need to consult you on it because you're, you're the expert on this and you'll, you'll get it through that. This is a cool action adventure story. But, but doesn't that sound like, like how, how is that not out there? <laughs> right. I it just, it just, it's an easy slam dunk, like right there. It's just, it's an epic story and in, in and of itself. So I don't know. I don't know why that's not out there. I know that, you know, in games you do have like shield maidens and berserkers and all of that kind of thing. I know there are games kind of based on that. Now, are those real things, berserkers and shield maidens, or is that kind of like a misunderstanding of, of you know, bits and pieces of evidence that we have from the, the Viking era. Again, there's kind of two ways of coming at it. In stories, they're definitely a real thing, right? So in the in the old Norse sagas from their own time, they talk about shield veins all the time. Um, it's actually not uncommon at all to have women who put on armor and go out and fight. Uh, sometimes it's for one particular occasion. So for instance, in the saga of the Volsungs, uh, at the, toward the end, there is a sister who puts on armor and grabs up weapons and fights to protect her brothers in their last fight. They're against overwhelming odds. Uh, 
Or then you have someone like Hervor in the saga, Hervor and Hadrick I just mentioned, where she's uh, she's a career warrior woman. So it's a it's a pretty normal feature of the myth, or not 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 even myth, but but even just sagas about human heroes. Um, how much that's a reality in in life uh, is something that is more a question for archaeologists, right? So here I'm going to say, oh, I'm I'm a, I'm a guy who studies language and text. I'm not studying bones, right? I right. Don't know stuff. But there's a very famous uh, burial that was actually discovered in the 19th century in Sweden that has long been assumed to have been just this great warlord. This skeleton that's found with a, a horse and tons of weapons and all these high status things like a game board for playing their chess like game. Um, you know, everyone just said, oh, this is a, this is some some war king. But in I think 2017, the skeleton was actually analyzed. It was found to be a woman. So now. All these questions are well okay so you you thought this was a war king when you thought this was a man and now you say well maybe this isn't really a warrior at all maybe this is some other symbolic thing but it kind of challenges all of our assumptions one way or the other right are people being buried with stuff that they didn't use in life well then that's interesting too or is this a woman who really was a, a, a warrior and that's a question again more for archaeologists than for you know language nerds like me but it, <laughs> But it really is something that, that that is all over their literature. Yeah, it, it really is. So that's I, I couldn't help but ask because I was like, it's that is prominent, you know, and you see in, in TV shows and video games, you you see these shield maidens, berserkers running around. And it definitely is very prominent in the stories. Speaking of stories, um, one of the cool things I read about you is that for a graduate project, you actually turned Star Wars into an Icelandic saga, which is super, super awesome. What compelled you to do that? So this is the part where I block the camera and I... And <laughs> no more questions! <laughs> yeah, I was told this wouldn't be asked. Um, yeah, so in... All right, so we were just talking... We were getting down about our generation before this interview. Yeah. So I was, I was very new to Facebook, and I didn't know what Facebook was about. I didn't know what to do with it. And you remember how it used to be a third person status update like Jackson. Yeah. Does. Okay. So I didn't know what else to do with that. So in grad school, I would always just fill that in with some Star Wars quote. Right? <laughs> Jackson is no moon. He's a space station. Right? <laughs> like that kind of stuff. And eventually one of my friends, Ben Fry, who was in a, in grad school with me said, you know, I think there's actually a lot that Star Wars has in common with Icelandic sagas. And I said, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is a saga, right? It's very similar, right? You have a story about a family that has some tragedy, there's some conflict within the family that's always a big deal within the saga. It's like, oh, how do I resolve this? Because I must fight him, but he's my father, that kind of stuff. Right. I thought this is, yeah, it's absolutely a saga. So I turned it into one. Um, it was actually pretty much practice for my PhD exams, right? I thought, hey, how better to learn the language than to write something in it than to try to actually imitate the style of the stuff that's in it. And uh, I put it together, and for some reason, the internet liked it. This is 20 years ago now, but it got on Reddit, and people found out about it. And, you know, I don't know how I feel about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're and, saying is if I, if I go through the old archives of Reddit, I can read it for myself. Or you can actually find it pretty easy. If you just search for, like, Star Wars, it's an Icelandic saga. I left the blog up that has it. Oh, did you? Okay, awesome. I'm gonna go take a look at that later because I, I read, I saw you had bits and pieces of it, but I wanted to read the whole thing because it just it's, sounds amazing. It's Star Wars yeah. and Old Norse together. That just yeah. so to clarify epic. for anybody who doesn't quite realize what I'm saying, I mean, I took the, I, I took the movies that existed at the time, right, the six movies, and I turned them into a Viking story, right? So, um, so. And, and I had to change some things, right? Because technology is different. Culture is different, right? There's no schools or anything like that. So the Jedi become a family, um, that kind of stuff. But it it, it kind of works. <laughs> well, it, obviously, because it, it, it got picked up and it was quite popular. But you also uh, have translated a bunch of the old sagas. So I wanted to give you a chance to sort of take this moment to promote yourself and tell people where you can find your work, uh, tell them a little bit about your YouTube channel and everything, because I, I, I think the audience is going to be super interested in that. Okay, well, yeah, find me on YouTube under just my name, just Jackson Crawford, and I've got 
hundreds of videos now about every question people ask me about North Sanction Bay. I, I try to make a couple a week just answering questions people ask me. So check that out. Um, I have actually translated most of the stuff that we've just been talking about. So there's the Poetic Edda, which is Yay. also available as an audiobook narrated by me, if you don't hate Nice. Me. Because it would have been really hard to teach somebody to pronounce all the names. <laughs> <laughs> That is the source for most of the stories of the Norse gods that have actually survived. That's the poems that survived from the Viking Age to be written down after the country, after Iceland was converted to Christianity. So that's actually where we get most of what we know about Odin, Thor, and Loki. And then I did the Wanderers Hallmall, which is a specific poem from the Poetic Edda. That's actually Odin's advice for good living. <gasps> yes. Are you living wisely? Let Odin tell you. Because <laughs> you're probably not. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Saga of the Volsungs, which is one of the great sagas of Norse heroes, also available as an audiobook narrated by me, if you don't hear my voice. Yeah. Yeah, so all that stuff's out there, and uh, you can find me at jacksonwcrawford.com. Remember the W. <laughs> yes, that's important. Yes, or I'm on Twitter at Norse by Southwest, which is Norse by SW. All right. Awesome. I'm so glad that we now know where to find you. Um, I think that's it for all of my questions. Um, again, you can find this interview on my Patreon at Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N-R Sullivan and my YouTube channel at Meg Sullivan. And it, this should also be going up on your channel as well, right? Yep. All right. Awesome. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get lots of people who will see this interview and uh, I, I thought it was a lot of fun. I don't know about you, but I had a great time. Absolutely, great questions. All right, thank you so much for joining me today and I will see everybody later. <laughs>